Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Are you a World of Warbirds fan? If so, you can help to keep the podcast going by supporting it through PayPal at WOWB17 or giving the podcast a good review or liking or sharing the Facebook page. I'd like to thank Dale Longmere for stepping up and becoming a Warbird supporter. It's really appreciated and helps me to continue this work. If you want to see the various aircraft described today, please check out the pictures on the World of Warbirds Facebook page. If you look through history, you can see a few individuals who are so advanced, who come up with ideas so novel, it makes one wonder if they are stranded time travelers who came from the future, somehow got stuck, and are unable to resist the temptation of introducing the ideas from their own present to their new home in the past. The classic example is Leonardo da Vinci, who invented such things as the automobile, the machine gun, the parachute, and multiple flying machines, including fixed-wing versions, a helicopter, and an ornithopter, which is a flying machine that flaps its wings like a bird. You gotta love the ornithopter. In our modern time, it seems like Elon Musk might be the time traveler who is reinventing the automotive and aerospace world, as well as coming up with new tunnel boring technologies, popularizing personal flamethrowers, and seemingly has created some kind of machine that can make billions of dollars out of thin air. However, in the 1930s, it was Britain's Barnes Wallace who seemed to be from the future. When you're looking at British aerospace in the 30s and 40s, he just keeps coming up. Although I haven't publicly admitted it yet on this podcast, I also have a slight obsession with airships. And who was there designing the R-100 for Vickers? Wallace. Then he switches sides in that battle for flying machine supremacy and started working on airplanes and helped design the Wellesley, the Wellington, the Warwick, and the Windsor. We also can't ignore his foray into bomb design when he basically invented the bunker buster bomb. And then there's the whole dam busting idea, which really on the face of it sounds crackers. After the war, he didn't stop there. He worked on swing wing technology. He invented a rocket power torpedo, was a consultant on the building of the Parkes radio telescope in Australia proposed a project to build giant cargo submarines, and his ideas led to research that ultimately led to the design of the air intakes for Concorde's mighty Olympus 593 engines. But today we are going to talk about the Vickers Wellington, which is a suggestion from Steve Zago, whose grandfather flew them in RAF 69 Squadron. Steve is one half of our new sponsor, the Lost Aircraft Coffee Company. The other half is Adam Wright, who was my first flight instructor and who taught me how to fly. Adam and Steve are airline pilots who were temporarily grounded due to the pandemic, and we'll hear more about them and Steve's grandfather later. Design and Development In 1932, the British Air Ministry issued Specification B9-32, which was seeking a twin-engine, medium daylight bomber. The Vickers Armstrong Company got to work under the leadership of their chief designer, Rex Pearson. Early in the process, Barnes Wallace, who was Vickers' chief structurer's designer, proposed the use of a geodetic airframe. Okay, so we're going to have to divert a little bit here to explain what this is and also to allow me to tell a personal anecdote. Geodetic is a design structure formed of diamond or triangle shapes. The other name for it is geodesic, and it was a word that I learned as a little kid, and then either impressed or annoyed adults by showing it off. The reason I learned it was that my dad was a draftsman for a consulting engineering firm in Montreal, and not too many years before I had arrived on the scene, There had been the 1967 Montreal World's Fair, or Expo. The American pavilion at the Expo was a giant dome. 
made up of steel triangles and covered by an acrylic skin. This had been designed by Buckmaster Fuller, and it had obviously impressed my dad because he taught me the concept of the geodesic dome, and it stuck. At some point after the World's Fair, the acrylic covering burned off, but the metal dome is still there 54 years later and is now known as the Biosphere, which is a museum entirely devoted to the links between society and the environment. But back in the 1930s, the concept had previously been used for designing nautical ships, but as it is an incredibly light and strong structure, it was suited for flying machines too, and so Wallace had used it on the R-100 airship and then on the single-engined Vickers Wellesley light bomber. During the building of that aircraft, they had been aiming for a strength factor of 6, but ended up with a strength factor of 11. This allowed them to actually shave off material from components to reduce the weight of the aircraft, but still maintain the desired strength. So for their new bomber, Wallace and Vickers drew inspiration from their Wellesley and came up with a fuselage design made up of 1,650 duraluminum W-beams, which comprised a metal framework. Wooden battens were attached to the metal frame, and Irish linen was stretched over this and covered with several layers of dope. The design was both traditional and revolutionary, both hearkening back to the fabric-covered aircraft of the First World War while looking forward to the geodesic designs of the future. The design allowed for a deep fuselage with lots of open area that in the future would, would permit many adaptations and alterations due to operational needs. The bomber was to have twin engines and Vickers played around with various power plants before settling on a pair of Bristol Pegasus radial engines for the prototype. These turned two de Havilland two-pitch propellers. The aircraft was a mid-wing design instead of having a shoulder-mounted wing. This was thought to allow for better pilot visibility, especially during formation flight. Unlike many bombers of the day, the new plane was to have a single large tail fin. Vickers began working on the prototype. Prototypes. In early 1936, the prototype serial number K4049 was rolled out. It could carry a combination of 250 or 500 pound bombs and had hand-operated turrets with a single gun in the nose and tail positions. There was also to be a third retractable turret gun in the dorsal position. The aircraft was meant to have a crew of between four and five. In June, the aircraft not only went on its maiden flight, but also got its first name, which was the Cressy. The test flight went very well, and the type was accepted to move into the production phase. In September, someone decided that Cressy just didn't have the right ring to it, and the new bomber was named Wellington. What's interesting about that choice of name is that the new bomber and its predecessor, the Wellesley, were named for the same man. General Arthur Wellesley, comma, the Duke of Wellington. In April of the next year, the project ran into a serious setback when, during a test flight, a horn balance on the elevator failed, flipping the aircraft inverted and diving straight into the ground. Horn balances are structures on the flight control surfaces that help the pilot to manipulate the controls. In the case of the elevator, when the pilot pulls the elevator one way with the control column, the horn surface extends into the slipstream the other way, catching on the wind and helping to pull the surface in the desired direction. The crash does not seem to have affected the attitude of anyone to the aircraft. It was already being recognized as an advanced and very good airplane. It's an unfortunate fact that sometimes planes crash during flight testing. Although it was a good airplane, improvements were still being made during the prototype phase, including lengthening the nose, refining the horizontal tail unit, adding a retractable tail wheel, and fitting constant speed propellers. A Nash and Thompson ventral turret was swapped in for the Vickers version. In August 1937, orders were placed for 180 Wellingtons. 
production. They were still tinkering with the design when the first production Wellington Mark I serial number L4212 first flew just before Christmas 1937. The aircraft was found to be nose-heavy in a dive, which was unsatisfactory, and led to a redesigned elevator and the interlinking of the flaps and the elevator trim tabs, and this seemed to fix the issue. By this time, the aircraft was also to get new engines, 1,050 horsepower Bristol Pegasus radials. Back in October 1937, the Gloucester Aircraft Company had been invited to the Wellington party and was issued an order for another 100 aircraft. A further 100 Wellingtons, known as Mark IIs, were ordered. These ones would be powered by Rolls-Royce Merlin 10 V12 engines. Other alterations were done to the hydraulic and oxygen systems and cabin heating, and an Astrodome for navigation was installed. The Wellington buying spree continued when Armstrong Whitworth Aircraft was asked to build 64 of them. In order to allow all these companies to more easily produce these mass numbers of aircraft, Vickers went on a simplification program with the target of being able to build one Wellington per day. By the time 1943 rolled around, they were building a Wellington usually within 60 hours. But in October of that year, at the Vickers plant in Broughton in North Wales, it was decided to try to meet the challenge and also beat the world record for building an aircraft set by a factory in California of 48 hours. I don't know what type of aircraft was the one built in California, but the workers at Broughton gave up their weekend specifically to build Wellington number LN514 under the stopwatch. For propaganda and morale-boosting purposes, the Ministry of Information brought in a film crew to record the attempt, and they filmed the assembly effort over the next 23 hours and 50 minutes. And the aircraft took off one hour after that. The film footage was edited into a newsreel called Worker's Weekend, which was shown in both Britain and America. The film is available on YouTube, and this is one of those few times where I wish the podcast was a YouTube channel, so that I could show you this Wellington bomber being fitted together like a giant model airplane. But it's available on YouTube, so go and check it out. The geodesic design really stands out in the film as it's screwed together, and the inherent strength can be guessed at by just looking at it. It looks like a fully integrated cage or basket, where even if some of the members are shot away, the rest would continue to carry the load. Also, the amount of sewing involved was a little shocking in that it's weird to see a fairly modern bomber being literally sewn together by seamstresses. The nine coats of dope were being slapped on in an enclosed space with no masks or ventilators. I wonder if they actually got dopey on the job. And this was the first time in aviation history that an aircraft manufacturer had attempted such a feat with a metal aircraft of this scale. And I guess it set the record to be eventually broken by the B-24 team when they were building an even bigger bomber, one every hour. We'll see in the operational history section how the Wellington became one of those warbirds like the B-25 or the Ju-88 or HE-111 that ended up being modified and adapted to many, many different roles. It was built throughout the war in 16 separate variants and two training versions. The total number of Wellingtons built was 11,462 of all versions and variants. A higher quantity produced than any other British bomber. Did you know that? I certainly did not before beginning my research on this aircraft. The very last Wellington to be produced was rolled out on the 13th of October, 1945. Operational History The Wellington, or the Wimpy, as RAF personnel called it, after the Popeye comic strip character J. Wellington Wimpy, was well in place for the outbreak of the war in Europe. Eight RAF regular squadrons and two reserve squadrons were all outfitted with Wellingtons when hostilities broke out. On the 4th of September, 1939, 24 hours after the start of fighting, 
14 Wellingtons of number 9 and number 149 squadrons had the honor of participating in the first RAF bombing raid of the war, which was a raid on German shipping at Brunsbüttel. The government ordered the RAF to attack the ships alone and not the harbor itself for fear of hitting any civilians. My, how those policies would change significantly during the war. The raid was not that successful due to a combination of bad weather and heavy AA fire, which also gave the Wellingtons the dubious distinction of being the first aircraft to be lost on the Western Front when two failed to return. Between September and December 1939, Wellingtons participated in multiple air battles, mostly involved in attacking shipping. On the 18th of December 1939, two dozen Wellingtons from RAF 9, 37, and 149 squadrons participated in what became known as the Battle of Heligoland Bight when they attacked the German fleet and naval bases in Schilling Roads and Wilhelmshaven. The Luftwaffe had been alerted by radar and were there to pounce on the attacking aircraft, knocking down half of them and damaging three more although the British air gunners did get four fighters in exchange. The bombing results were terrible, as many aircraft didn't drop their bombs due to the still-in-effect policy to avoid civilians. And the formation was badly mauled by the Luftwaffe and AA. The battle caused shifts in policy, both for Bomber Command in general, which decided that the bomber would always get through thing maybe was flawed, and they would switch to nighttime operations. And for the Wellington in particular, which was moved to a role of attacking industrial targets instead of head-on attacks on the German fleet and air forces. Night operations began, and the Wimpy was seen as a well-suited aircraft for these missions, which is reflected in the number ordered and built for this role. The Wellington was known as a sturdy aircraft and most capable of the medium British bombers of the time. One of the reasons was that Wellingtons had a voluminous bomb bay that could carry the 2,000 and even 4,000 pound cookie bombs that the RAF was soon using. On the 25th of August, 1940, Wellingtons were over Berlin during the first night raid on the German capital. Operation Millennium was the first ever 1,000 bomber raid conducted by the RAF. Everyone is attracted by round numbers, and so the idea of a thousand aircraft raid was seen as a propaganda coup by RAF Bomber Command Head Sir Arthur Harris. And so, on the night of 30 to 31 May 1942, the German city of Cologne was hit. Now, if you were thinking it was 1,000 Lancasters, Halifaxes, and Stirlings, you'd be wrong. Bomber Command was in the midst of transitioning to four-engine heavy bombers at the time and only had about 400 Lancasters and Halifaxes for the mission. Harris had to borrow aircraft from RAF Coastal Command and from Flying Training Command to flesh out his 1,000. The Navy balked at what they figured was a publicity stunt for the RAF and pulled their aircraft from the mission, arguing probably rightly, that they had better things to do with the aircraft, you know, such as fighting the Battle of the Atlantic. So at least 49 of the aircraft on Operation Millennium were flown by student pilots and instructors. Let's just say that was a big jump in the curriculum. About 60% of the aircraft sent on Millennium were Wellingtons. And that was 599 machines out of the eventual 1,046 RAF aircraft. The type continued to be liked as a reliable aircraft that would be able to bring crews home after suffering terrible damage. Part of this was reality, in that the geodesic design was indeed very strong and redundant. The other thing that added to the perception of invulnerability was that as a fabric-covered metal-framed aircraft, Sometimes major areas of doped linen would burn away by fire, but the aircraft would return, seemingly with half the fuselage missing. As more and more lanks and halibags were brought into service, the Wellingtons were shifted into different roles, and this type was well suited to do other work. 
Wellingtons flew for Coastal Command, doing valuable anti-submarine work in the Battle of the Atlantic. In a truly weird-looking modification, some Wellingtons were modified with this huge 48-foot diameter crazy metal loop that ran from the nose and in front of the props and then to the mid-fuselage at the back. These were known as DWI Wellingtons. DWI stood for Directional Wireless Installation, which was a deceiving cover story for the loop. What it really was, was a magnetic field generator to set off magnetic naval mines when the aircraft flew over them. The aircraft had an extra engine, which was a Ford V8, mounted inside the fuselage driving a big electrical generator in order to make enough electricity to generate the magnetic field in the loop. Wellingtons were also used as an early version of what we would now call AWACS, or Airborne Warning and Control Systems. In 1944, Wellingtons from 407 Squadron, RCAF, were mounted with radar to serve with the RAF's Fighter Interception Unit. They would loiter around at an altitude of about 4,000 feet over the North Sea and would control Bristol Bowfighter fighters and de Havilland Mosquitoes to intercept Henkel HE-111 bombers doing airborne launches of V-1 flying bombs. The controllers in the Wellington would search and find the HE-111 and then vector the bowfighter to go after the bomber and the Mosquito would attempt to chase down and intercept the V-1. The Wellington was built in a whole bunch of variants. About 400 of them were built with Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Later, Wellingtons were up-engined with 1,375 Bristol Hercules engines and up-gunned with four-gun rear turrets instead of the original two-gun turrets. 220 were built using 1,200 horsepower Pratt & Whitney twin WASP engines. 307 Coastal Command Wellingtons were used for reconnaissance, anti-submarine, and anti-shipping, and were fitted with radars, and some of them were fitted with the Lee Light for anti-submarine work. Wellingtons were modified to carry rockets, torpedoes, and depth charges. There was a transport version and a trainer version. Also, experimental Wellingtons were used to test everything but the kitchen sink. Some of these were used to test pressurization systems for high altitude work, and these used turbocharged Hercules 8 engines. One was a test bed for a 40 mm Vickers gun turret, while another one tested the turbine light, which was an even more powerful airborne searchlight. Wellingtons were used to test a variety of new turbojet and turboprop engines. Perhaps the one role that the Wellington was not suited for was glider towing. This was a job that many of Bomber Command's older aircraft, such as the Sterling, were given after they became obsolete for frontline duties. The geodesic structure just wasn't stiff enough lengthwise, and so when towing a glider, it would actually stretch slightly. Although the strong airframe was actually fine and there was no danger of anything coming apart, the stretch of the fuselage would mess up the pilot's ability to control the aircraft because the long runs of cables and push-pull rods, which of course were not stretching along with the fuselage, so Wellingtons were not used for glider tugs. Lastly, the Vickers Warwick was to be an updated, larger, and up-engined version of the Wellington. The plan was to use the Napier Sabre engine for the Warwick, but trouble and delays in the development of that engine meant that the Bristol Centaurus and Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp engines were tried. In the end, before it even came into its own, the Warwick itself was superseded by the other British four-engine bombers, and it was relegated into maritime reconnaissance, air-sea rescue, and transport roles. They only built about 800 of them. Pilots. We're going to talk about two pilots today. 
James Allen Ward was born on the 14th of June, 1919, in Wanganui, New Zealand. I don't think we've talked about any Kiwis yet in this podcast, and I think it's time. Is it alright to say Kiwi? Is it like Canuck for Canadians, which is fine, or is it an insult? I'm not sure, and please let me know. Anywho, uh, Ward was a teacher when the Second World War began, but right away signed up for the Royal New Zealand Air Force. He began his initial training at 11, and then headed to the number one elementary flying training school at RNZAF Terreri, and then advanced flight training at Wiggum Air Force Base in Christchurch. After qualifying as a pilot and being promoted to sergeant, he shipped out for England in 1941. He was selected for heavy bombers, trained and eventually posted to number 75 Squadron RAF. This was an RAF unit, but it was mainly comprised of RNZAF flying personnel, which were to operate 30 Wellingtons that had been purchased by the New Zealand government. His first operational mission was a bombing mission to Dusseldorf in Germany on the 14th of June 1941, acting as second pilot to squadron leader, and Canadian by the way, Reuben Widowson. They operated as a crew together for several more missions until the night of 7th of July, which was a raid on Munster. At this point, I'm going to let the citation for Ward's Victoria Cross which was published in the London Gazette on the 5th of August, 1941, speak for itself. Opening quotes. On the night of 7 July, 1941, Sergeant Ward was second pilot of a Wellington bomber returning from an attack on Munster. While flying over the Zyder Z at 13,000 feet, his aircraft was attacked from beneath by a German BF-110, which secured hits with cannon shells and incendiary bullets. The rear gunner was wounded in the foot, but delivered a burst of fire, sending the enemy fighter down, apparently out of control. Fire then broke out in the Wellington's near starboard engine, and, fed by petrol from a split pipe, quickly gained an alarming hold and threatened to spread to the entire wing. The crew forced a hole in the fuselage and made strenuous efforts to reduce the fire with extinguishers and even coffee from their flasks without success. They were then warned to be ready to abandon the aircraft. As a last resort, Sergeant Ward volunteered to make an attempt to smother the fire with an engine cover which happened to be in use as a cushion. At first, he proposed discarding his parachute to reduce wind resistance, but was finally persuaded to take it. A rope from the aircraft dinghy was tied to him, though this was of little help and might have become a danger had he been blown off the aircraft. With the help of his navigator, he then climbed through the narrow astrodome and put on his parachute. The bomber was flying at a reduced speed, but the wind pressure must have been sufficient to render the operation one of extreme difficulty. Breaking the fabric to make hand and footholds where necessary, and also taking advantage of existing holes in the fabric, Sergeant Ward succeeded in descending three feet to the wing and proceeding another three feet to a position behind the engine despite the slipstream from the air screw which nearly blew him off the wing. Lying in this precarious position, he smothered the fire in the wing fabric and tried to push the engine cover into the hole in the wing and on the leaking pipe from which the fire came. As soon as he had removed his hand, however, a terrific wind blew the cover out, and when he tried again, it was lost. Tired as he was, he was able, with the navigator's assistance, to make a successful but perilous journey back to the aircraft. There was now no danger of fire spreading from the petrol pipe as there was no fabric left near it and in due course it burned itself out. When the aircraft was nearly home, some petrol which had collected in the wing blazed up furiously but died down quite suddenly. A safe landing was made despite the damage sustained to the aircraft. The flight home had been made possible by the gallantry of Sergeant Ward in extinguishing the fire on the wing in circumstances of the greatest difficulty and at the risk of his life. 
After the ordeal, even though he must have had balls of steel for accomplishing what he did, Ward was apparently overwhelmed when he met Prime Minister Churchill and couldn't answer the PM's questions. Churchill, who always seems to know what to say, said, You must feel very humble and awkward in my presence, he said. Yes, sir, managed Ward. Well, then you can imagine how humble and awkward I feel in yours, said Churchill. Ward did not come out of the mission unscathed, although these were the type of wounds that aren't visible. Sometime after a well-deserved leave after his perilous mission, during dinner, someone spilled fuel from a cigarette lighter onto Ward's hand and it was accidentally set alight. The event triggered and brought back terrible memories of his actions out on the flaming wing of the Wellington bomber. The doctor who treated the burn gave Ward a note stating that he was not fit to fly at this time, but it was never passed on. When Ward got back to his squadron, he was given command of his own crew and aircraft, and his next mission to Brest went without incident. However, on the 15th of September 1941, the second mission after his VC flight was a raid on Hamburg, and it was a different story. Ward's Wellington was jumped by a night fighter right after bombs away. After the night fighter attack, Ward was again flying a burning bomber. This time, he ordered his crew to bail out as he attempted to hold the stricken aircraft steady. Two of his crew did get out, and they finished the war as prisoners of war. However, Ward's Wellington crashed near Hamburg with the rest of his crew still aboard, and they all lost their lives. Tragically, it was initially reported to Ward's family that he had survived the crash and was a POW. And it would take almost a year for the International Red Cross to confirm that he was KIA. He is interned in the Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery, Olsdorf, in Hamburg. One Wellington pilot who made it back was W.A. Bartlett, the grandfather of Steve Zago, one of the owners of our sponsor, Lost Aviator Coffee. Steve is a working pilot, and I met with him last week, when he had a layover in Montreal. We had a coffee, talked about flying, warbirds, and especially his grandfather. Now, often stories about veterans get lost. Firstly, the vets may not want to talk about what they saw and did. Secondly, and amazingly, many vets don't really think that what they did was that remarkable. They consider themselves just one of millions who answered the call, did their thing, and were lucky enough to get back. That in itself made them the lucky ones. And I've heard some vets say that the real heroes were the ones who didn't get back. We're lucky that Bartlett's story has not been lost because his family insisted on getting it written down and self-published in a book for the family. And Steve was generous enough to lend it to me. Bartlett was from southwestern Ontario, Canada, and was 16 when the war broke out. He was actually excited because here was a chance to get away from the humdrum farm life, join the Air Force, and learn to fly. Not all the adults in his life felt the same. His father had been two years in France during the Great War in artillery. But Bartlett had to wait, and a little after his 18th birthday, he joined up. Like so many other aircrew trained by the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, he started out on Tiger Moths, and then transitioned to Harvard's, and then started flying ferry battles, towing target drogues for gunnery practice. He did this for nine months, and then finally got what he wanted, a posting overseas in August 1943. It took another six months of travel and hurry up and wait to finally start the business of training on twin-engined airspeed Oxfords, and then transitioning to the Wellingtons. After that, Bartlett did all kinds of duties, from a mission known as a nickel, which was dumping 700-pound loads of newspapers to the French resistance, to bullseye missions, where they would pretend to be a group of bombers and provide a diversion while the main bomber stream went elsewhere. These were still technically training missions. Then Bartlett was posted to 69 Squadron, which was equipped with Wellingtons, for which the superchargers had been removed. 
The work was going to be low level, and so superchargers were not required. This actually meant that their machines were lighter, and there was less load on the engines, so they had a bit more zip. The nose turret had been pulled out and replaced by a plastic nose for greater visibility, and a camera was mounted in the belly. In the bomb bay, 18 bunches of 1 million candle power magnesium flares were loaded into the bomb stations. Initially, the missions were, in quotations, just to drop flares on suspected transportation targets, then turn around and photograph the target and return to base with the film. I put the just in quotes because I still think that this was an incredibly ballsy thing to be doing at night in a fast twin-engine aircraft at between 3,000, but often as low as three to 400 feet, with people shooting at you. Bartlett had an advantage in this area. His squadron leader had at one time been an officer in the artillery, more specifically, anti-aircraft. He told his crews, when they saw the tracers coming up at them, that they should actually turn towards them, as it would throw off the aim of the gunners and give them a shorter exposure time to the fire. I mean, I get it, in theory, but can you actually imagine doing it? <laughs> After the invasion, the squadron was posted to Brussels, and later on, they began carrying bombs too, so that they could hit the targets also, instead of just taking pictures for someone else to attack later. One time, they were attacked by radar-guided flak when at about 4,000 feet, and Bartlett dove his Wellington for the deck in order to get away from it. The speed rocketed up to about 275 knots, although he wasn't 100% sure about the speed because the instrument panel was blacked out. Pulling out required putting his feet against the instrument panel and pulling with all his might, and they leveled out at about 600 feet. When they got back on the ground, there were 30 holes in the fuselage. This was another testimony to the durability of the Wellington. Of course, not everyone came back. Bartlett wrote, quote, Another trying part of the job was dealing personally with the crew losses. These were heavy, as I recall. The squadron lost seven crews in the six weeks from mid-December to early February. Mostly crews that went missing just disappeared into the void, and we did not know what happened to them. This was always a huge downer for me, giving me several days of depression that, of course, had to be concealed. On several occasions, I remember thinking that, in another two days, I would be feeling better. Close quotes. In April 1945, the squadron was moved to an aerodrome on the Belgian coast and lent a hand with Coastal Command. It seems that Antwerp was being attacked by German mini-submarines. So, without much instruction or information, and with no practice, they loaded up on depth charges and headed out over the sea looking for subs. They patrolled for about three and a half hours, and two Wellingtons saw and attacked what they thought were subs, but there was no way of knowing if they were, or if they were destroyed. Two nights later, Bartlett and his crew attacked the Kiel Canal area, encountering oodles of flak, and didn't feel like they accomplished very much. On the way back, Allied searchlights were playing with them and coned them in a pyramid of light, probably hoping for a little cat-and-mouse game. But Bartlett and his crew were tired, and they didn't feel like playing. A brusque message was tapped out to the searchlight controllers, and they turned off the lights. And after that mission, Bartlett's fighting war was over. Before shipping back to Canada, there were some Ruhr Valley sightseeing runs to fly, and Bartlett also had a familiarization flight in a Mosquito, which must have been fun. There were also several weeks of work in an aerial geographic survey of northern Europe being done by the British Army. This involved dropping flares over certain landmarks so that the ground sightings could be made and measured from great distances. Imagine how Bartlett and his crew felt on July 4th when one of those missions, that was supposed to be milk runs, I mean, the war was over, but one of their 40 flares in the bomb bay got hung up 
and was swinging about badly in the bay and banging into the other flares. Yes, they're only flares, but they're also incendiary devices. If 40 flares go up in flames in your bomb bay, then you're probably going down in flames. Bartlett slammed down the flaps and slowed the Wellington down so that the loose flare wouldn't be banging around so badly and spotted a British destroyer below and got ready for ditching, if the need would arise. He called out dingy, dingy, dingy over the intercom system to let his crew know to get ready to get wet. But before they had to put the wimpy down in the drink, the jarring banging of the loose flare abruptly stopped. The navigator had hacked a hole in the bomb bay and reached in and released the flare to fall away safely. I recall that a character in Len Dighton's book Bomber had done precisely the same thing, but that the photo flash bomb had gone off in the process, blinding and burning the crewman. But luckily for Bartlett's navigator, all he got was a sprained wrist and an Air Force Cross medal for his resourcefulness and bravery. A few days later, Bartlett was told to fly a plane load of Canadians to Bournemouth on the south coast of the UK. There was a homeward-bound troop ship there with some extra space. It was the last time he would fly a Wellington or any other airplane. It may seem cliché to say that many of the fighting men just wanted to get home and then live in peace for the rest of their lives. It seems that W.A. Bartlett was able to do just that taking advantage of his veteran's benefit to earn a forestry degree and working in northern Ontario in the forestry industry for the rest of his life, raising a family along the way and living to the ripe old age of 93. Survivors Wellington served with the air forces of many countries, including Australia, Canada, Free France, Greece, New Zealand, Portugal, Poland, South Africa, and Nazi Germany. Yeah, I got that one right. A Wellington was captured, fixed up, and flown by the Luftwaffe. So, it's shocking that only two survivors exist. Wellington 1A serial number N2980 can be seen at the Brooklyn's Museum at Brooklyn's, Surrey. It ditched in Loch Ness on the last day of December 1940, and presumably served as an underwater plaything for Nessie until recovered in September 1985 and restored for the next decade and a half. The Royal Air Force Museum has Wellington serial number MF628, which served as a post-war aircrew trainer. It was also used in the movie The Dam Busters, where it can be seen taking off, and it was also used for air-to-air -air filming by the movie crew. This aircraft was the last Wellington ever to fly in January 1955. If you get some joy out of listening, please consider supporting the podcast by making a modest donation via PayPal. My PayPal address is at WOWB17. That's at World of Warbird17, or if you want to remember it this way, at WOWB17. You'll have my eternal gratitude.